Our topic for today is uh, compliance by design. So we'll talk about uh, different uh, regulations that are related to, uh, to software development and uh, how to apply it to uh, your projects and why we need to apply it and like common problems uh, and stuff like that. So uh, my name is Alexander Zhukov. I'm a Ableton technical lead in SoftServe. Uh, so I've been working with several projects uh, that uh, had to do with the compliance. So we were, like dealing with the SOX compliance, uh, GDPR, uh, and uh, right now I'm working uh, with the client who's helping other people to develop HIPAA compliant applications. Uh, so there are some interesting things uh, going on there as well. So hopefully I'll be able to share a couple of cool and interesting uh, insights uh, that will be helpful. So uh, the agenda is as following. We'll, I'll give you a short introduction, um, an overview of uh, most common regulations. They are mostly related to the uh, United States because uh, most of our clients like uh, are from US and uh, they have the most regulations, I guess. Uh, then we uh, talk more deeply about HIPAA, SOX compliance and GDPR. Um, I'll also cover uh, how to be compliant uh, in cloud environments, including AWS and GCP. Uh, and uh, I'll also briefly cover third-party solutions that will help you to uh, stay compliant. So, uh, basically, uh, why do we need to be compliant? Um, so, the, the first thing is uh, fines and legal pen penalties, because they really, could be really strict, and uh, you will lose money. Uh, some people can even go to jail if they don't comply. So uh, this is really important. Um, uh, there's also re reputation, reputational damage. For example, if you have a data breach uh, because you didn't comply to some particular regulation, uh, you will just lose your reputation, your customers. Uh, this is going to be bad for your business. Uh, and also marketing and partnerships because uh, some uh, uh, organizations require you to uh, comply to certain regulations if you want to supply your services for for that for those customers. So we will talk about that uh, in just a bit. Uh, so this is kind of an overview uh, of common like uh, reasons why you should be compliant. So yeah, famous <laughs> or infamous examples of uh, big companies uh, not being compliant. So this is the GDPR related. Uh, Fines, for for example, uh, the Google Sweden uh, was uh, fined for uh, seven million euros because uh, they failed to remove personal information uh, from their search results. So it turns out that even such big companies as Google, they have really big troubles uh, being compliant. Uh, the other case is Uber. Uh, they were fined because they had a data breach uh, and uh, they lost, like, uh, exposed actually uh, lots of uh, customer uh, records, which is also like uh, a big violation. So uh, this also affects like some such clients as Uber. And the biggest GDPR violation in history was actually related to British Airways. Uh, so also uh, about half million of customer records were stolen. And after the investigation, uh, it turned out that they didn't have, didn't implement the uh, GDPR best practices that lead to the uh, data uh, breach, actually. Um, so I'll give you some stats. Uh, for example, this is the total fines um, related to GDPR compliance uh, for the uh, last two years. Uh, these are millions of dollars. Like, so for example, uh, in 2000, uh, 2019, uh, the total amount of GDPR fines were uh, 441 million dollars, uh, which is a pretty big uh, number actually. And in 2012, uh, actually, uh, it's only 56 million uh, at the current date, but uh, probably it will be uh, a bit more till the end of the year. But you can see that people basically uh, started uh, actually being compliant, and also. Fines related to HIPAA compliant, well, compliance violations, you can see uh, th these are also million, millions of dollars. So each year, approximately 20 to 30 million uh, dollars of fine 
fines being issued to companies. Doesn't seem like a big number, uh, but it turns out that uh, these numbers are related to or to like small amount of companies. For example, this uh, 30 million of dollars only account for 10 companies. So each company uh, can get an average like $3 million of fines, which could be pretty big actually. And also the reputational damage and you still, and they still have to fix their problems. So um, yeah. Uh, so next I'll talk about uh, the most common regulations uh, that uh, you can encounter um, if you work with, for example, US customers. Uh, yeah, so you can see that uh, there are many more uh, regulations including PEGRAM, Sorbanes-Oxley uh, Act, uh, HIPAA, PCI DSS, FISMA, and uh, GDPR. So most of them, uh, including like PCI DSS, HIPAA, and FISMA, and GDPR, they mostly deal with data privacy and data security. Uh, uh, things like Sorbanes-Oxley uh, deals mostly with um, data integrity and transparency. And FedRAMP is, is something like a risk management program, but it's also like um, a standard that uh, sometimes can be required. So we'll talk about uh, each of them in a bit more detail. With, uh, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. So FISMA, uh, FISMA is a Federal Information Security Management Act. So this actually requires agencies uh, to implement information security uh, programs uh, to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the information. So this basically applies to federal agency and uh, throughout the uh, function of this uh, standard, it was extended to include the insurance companies, students loans, Medicare, and many more. So every federal agency basically must comply with that. Uh, so some high level requirements of, of that standard include maintaining the inventory and information system. Basically this is the catalog of all the systems that you work with. Uh, categorizing information uh, uh, according to the risk level. So basically uh, if uh, losing the, such particular information poses the, the most risk that uh, it falls in one category. Uh, if this information is not that important, it falls into another category. So basically you have to have a catalog uh, you have to have a security plan, basically how do you do protect your data and what do you do if you have a data breach. Uh, you have to utilize security controls. What are security controls? Uh, we'll talk about uh, in the next slide. Uh, conducting risk assessment uh, is basically a procedure to identify risks and mitigate them. And the certification and accreditation is basically um, done by external uh, audits and continuous monitoring as usual you just monitor your system uh, to be aware of everything that's going on inside so let's talk about what does security controls mean so basically security controls are safeguards or processes uh, that help you to avoid uh, detect uh, and correct the uh, data breaches or uh, attacks. For example, uh, th there are three uh, categories of security controls, preventive, detective, and corrective. So basically what does this mean? It's preventive is you prevent uh, security risks. Detective is what you do if you uh, do, do have a security breach or some kind of problem. And corrective controls is what you do uh, if you detect uh, a security problem and how you correct that. For example, if you have a data breach, what do you do? Like, do you do if you have a like user that is not authorized, but it has access to your data, you have to uh, lock lock down this user, right? This is like the example of the corrective action. Um, so basically, these controls guarantee the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all your data. Uh, the next standard is FedRAM. The FedRAM is the Federal Risk Management program. Basically, uh, this program applies to uh, service providers, uh, especially like cloud service providers uh, that want to work with government agencies. For example, uh, if you are a cloud provider like an Amazon or Google and you want to 
supply your services to government agencies, you have to be Fedram compliant. If you don't, if you, you if you are not Fedram compliant, you cannot work with such agencies. So you you're kind of out of the market. So this is not mandatory, but uh, as you can see, uh, if you want to expand your businesses, uh, this can be uh, a good thing to actually implement. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, basically, uh, to to be federal compliant, meaning that uh, you work with federal agencies and you kind of want to supply services um, to different clients. Uh, the next one is a famous PCI DSS, uh, which is Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. Uh, it was created by the uh, Payment Card Industry Security Standard Council to uh, improve the uh, security of the payment and to fight the payment card fraud. It's al also not mandatory, but it's kind of uh, required by the uh, this PCI uh, Council, uh, which includes like major payment providers and, uh, for example, like. MasterCard, Visa, and others, they kind of all require the standard uh, if you want to work with the credit card data. If you don't, like, uh, it's, it's not mandated, but you still can be fined, and, or you can be like uh, restricted from using separate, uh, some specific services. Uh, so it's better to have PCI DSS compliance in place. Um, so PCI DSS have 12, require, 12 main requirements uh to be compliant so the first one is uh to have a firewall uh to basically uh protect all your uh the entire system um the second one is uh change in vendor supply at the polls which is like when you install new software or uh configure new hardware you have to like change all the default configurations so things like admin uh, and password as the polls are not allowed you have to change it to something more secure uh, protecting stored card holders data, whatever that means, like storing it in a database, uh, in an encrypted format, or in some other ways, you have to do that. Every, every data has to be uh, stored securely. Uh, the next is encrypting the transmission of the data, which is just using uh, secure protocols, it's pretty simple. Uh, Protecting all systems against malware. This basically includes antivirus software, developing and maintaining secure systems and applications. This general concept, you basically have to apply the best security practices. Uh, the next one is interesting. You have to restrict access to cardholder data to only authorized personnel uh, and only to those who need to know. So for example, if uh, someone uh, works with customer uh, orders and they need to know uh, the payment details uh, they can they can access the data no one other than uh, people who actually work with the data should not uh, get the access and uh, uh, the next one is assign a unique id to each person with computer access this is basically to identify every person in case something goes wrong or there's a data breach you have to identify who was the so restricting physical access to cardholder data, this basically means that uh, your servers and files and everything else is physically secure and no one can actually uh, uh, get the access to that. Tracking and monitor monitoring all access to cardholder data um, is done by monitoring. So you have also to have a testing plan uh, for your security controls and you have to maintain an information security policy, which is basically a, a document with all the rules and processes you have related to security. So this is like the high level overview of PCI DSS. The exact implementation actually will depend on your system. So uh, we'll move uh, uh, to HIPAA, which is uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, so it was actually created to help uh, people maintain their insurance information when they change jobs. So basically, uh, this actually uh, implies that people have to uh, be able to keep their medical information uh, stored somewhere, 
but without the risk this information is going to be stolen or disclosed. Um, so basically the most important concept concepts of HIPAA is uh, the privacy rule which says that uh, basically your data uh, data of your customers uh, have to be private it's called a PHI which is like protected health information uh, and me, uh, this like includes patient uh, insurance numbers email uh, anything else that can be like uh, identified a person so for example if you have a scan of or an image of um, some patient or his analysis or some medical data that includes his uh, information that can identify him. Uh, this is like a protected health information uh, you have to deal with. Uh, so to be HIPAA compliant, basically the easiest way is just to not look at the person protected data and not hear about protected data and don't, do not speak about protected data. Then you're HIPAA compliant. Uh, so the security rule is basically a uh, security rule says that you have to protect the uh, protect the protect the PHI basically. So uh, the security rule says that you have to have like uh, three different uh, categories of safeguards: the administrative safeguards, technical safeguards, and physical safeguards. These safeguards will actually help you to uh, protect about uh, protect from data disclosures and data breaches. Um, so examples of administrative safeguards. So for example, uh, you have to have a security management process uh, which might include uh, risk analysis and audit log reviews, uh, etc. You have to have a security official. That's basically the person who is responsible for the whole security processes and uh, who will actually, uh, the person who will have all the problems if you have uh, data breach uh, so this is like kind of a really important role so you have to uh, have like uh, a workforce security uh, to ensure the proper access to your data uh, you have to have like an access management uh, so basically uh, again only people and systems who need to use this data should have the access no no one other should, should not be able to access this data uh, security training and awareness, which uh, which is something like we have in SoftServe, uh, you should have this uh, available and basically enforce your employees to, to pass this training, uh, so they are aware of all the security processes uh, you should have. Uh, another important thing is security incident procedures, uh, which is basically what do you do if you happen to have uh, a security incident? For example, if you have a data breach, uh, you have to have a process like, for example, you notify certain people, uh, what, how do you mitigate, how do you uh, remediate the issue, for example, how do you uh, minimize the amount of data that is disclosed? For example, if you disclose one, only one a customer record, this might, be not that bad because uh, it's only one case. If you lose like or disclose like 500 or 5,000 customer records, this is important and you even have to like uh, address this in media. You have to uh, publish uh, uh, like a post that your data were, were breached so people know that there was a breach. If they like use your services, they know that uh, their data can be compromised. So you have to minimize that. This all falls down under the security incident procedures. Uh, the next category is physical safeguards. Uh, so what are physical safeguards? Um, this is basically uh, access control to uh, servers, workstation security protection, uh, workstation policies, like for example, uh, automatic log off systems and device and media security controls. So, so for example, if you use like flash drives or something else, or paper data, you have to basically have rules how to, how to properly utilize and um, destroy them. And uh, technical safeguards are uh, the most important safeguards for uh, developers. Uh, so for example, user and software access controls, 
so autom like automatic log ops functions uh, authentication controls uh, this is as usual like you assign a unique id to a user uh, you require uh, passwords or even two-factor authentication or even bi biometric information <clears throat> uh, and you have to have an audit control so if uh, if something happens uh, you should be able to have a trace of uh, what was going on. So for example, if there was a data breach or data corruption, you have to be able to go back in time and trace uh, the series of events. So everything should be logged. Uh, maybe you should even have like a database of events, not just log files. So if something happened, you have to help. You should be, you should be able to actually uh, read the history. Uh, integrity controls, so this is something like signatures or checksum verification for uh, documents that contain EPHI, which is like electronic protected health information, uh, and transmission and security. Uh, so for example, if you transmit the data, you have to use secure channels like encrypted emails, uh, HTTPS, uh, Okay, so the next one is GDPR. So uh, this is like the general data protection regulation. Uh, so basically outlines uh, a, a set of rules for people who work, uh, process and store customer data. They, this standard mostly protects the privacy rights uh, and the data privacy. Um, So, um, the data security. Um, this is basically this, the, uh, the checklist uh, that you can use for, uh, if you want to implement a system that is GDPR compliant. Uh, so the, the first uh, category of checklist uh, is the data security checklist. So uh, this is actually from the uh, site that provides uh, like official GDPR uh, documentation. So you can really use this. Uh, checklist uh, in your job and uh, the link uh, will be attached to the presentation. So uh, the first one is uh, you have to take data protection into account at all times. Uh, so from the start of your product until you like stop uh, running it. Uh, the second one is encrypt pseudo anonymized or anonymized personal data whenever possible. For example, if you log uh, request or you lock anything or you store anything it's better than you uh, do not use uh, emails or names addresses directly uh, you can use like uh, just UUIDs or something like that that does not mean anything and you can like uh, bind this uh, user IDs to actual user data in your database and in case you like disclose this uh, anonymized data you basically do not disclose users data which is harmless uh, but if you for example log a user email in, and you like lose your logs uh, this can be a problem so like the common practice is to basically avoid using any kind of identifiable and identifiable information uh, so creating internal security policy basically teaching your uh, personal uh, how they should behave and what they should do uh, so your uh, stay GDPR compliant. So uh, data protection impact assessment, this is basically uh, uh, like a periodic assessment uh, of all your processes and how well you protect your data because things change. And once something has changed, your processes may be out of date and you have to apply new ones. Uh, so you have to do this constantly. Uh, and you have to have a process to notify the authorities or and your data sub subjects in the event of data breach. So notification channels, uh, like uh, for example, you, you can have a, your status dashboard or you can have like a media channel whatever you have to be able to quickly uh, notify people about such events. This kind of also helps to mitigate uh, like big consequences. So uh, the next uh, type of checklist is accountability and governance. So uh, this is mainly for executives, but we'll still cover that. Uh, so 
basically we have to have a person that is responsible for ensuring that GDPR compliance uh, across the organization exists. Uh, the second one is you have to sign a data processing agreement uh, between your organization and any third parties that uh, process your data because, for example, if you have a third party that kind of processes your logs or works with your databases, they have the access to your, uh, to your customer's data and they also have to be aware of that and they have to comply to GDPR requirements. Uh, and if your organization is inside, uh, outside of the uh, European Union, you have to appoint a representative uh, within one of the uh, EU member states. And you have to have a data protection officer. Uh, so the privacy rights. Uh, this is kind of uh, a big topic uh, uh, because yeah, you have to basically do a lot of a lot of stuff to uh, to be uh, GDPR compliant with respect to privacy rights. For example, uh, it's, it should be easy for your customers to request and receive all the information that you store about them. Uh, this might sound easy, like uh, just uh, doing a, a zip export of all the data. This might sound simple, but if you have a big system uh, that stores data in different sources, this uh, can be really tricky to assemble all that information, especially if it's like different kinds of information. So, so implementing that functionality, especially in, in the legacy systems, is a real pain in the ass. So I've worked with such systems and sometimes uh, we had to acknowledge that we cannot really actually dump all the data. We can only dump certain data. Um, so uh, it should be easy to correct and update inaccurate or incomplete information. This is easy. You just like can implement something like an edit profile or something else. This is pretty much easy. The second one is famous right to be forgotten. Uh, so it should be easy for customers to request uh, their data to be deleted. Uh, this is a really, really big topic and really controversial because uh, sometimes it's really hard to delete all the data, especially again in, in legacy systems. If you have logs that are archived in several places, you cannot really uh, read through all of these logs to delete uh, a single particular uh, user email, right? This is uh, troublesome. So. Uh, sometimes people just uh, acknowledge that, okay, we uh, can delete almost all of your data, but uh, some of your, your data can be stored in backups for some amount of time. For example, they, this data will be stored up to a month and then, and then the, the backups are erased automatically. So your data will be deleted or, or you can store these backups, for, for example, for half a year. Right, so you have to uh, take the risks that uh, the, or not all data can be deleted. Uh, and you have to actually um, provide the expectations for your customers. For example, if you do not delete their data, uh, you are not using it, you are not disclosing it, this might also be okay. But this is really like a uh, really hard thing to implement. So in one of our projects, we were uh, not really able to completely erase all customers' data and we had to actually acknowledge that uh, some of the records will still be in our logs uh, and we have to actually deal with it, but this data should not really go anywhere. We don't process it, we uh, don't disclose it, so it might be okay for people. Uh, yeah, so it should be easy also to receive a copy of personal data in, uh, in, in the format that can be transferred to another company. Um, and it also should be easy for your customers to object to your processing the data. So for example, if you see uh, this, uh, we use cookies, banners uh, on the side, that this is it. So basically, if you uh, reject uh, using cookies, this is basically your uh, objecting to processing um, your data. So uh, yeah, and you have to make decisions about people uh, and automated processes. You have a procedure to protect all right, so uh, the next one uh, is Sorbane's Oxley, uh, which is uh, a bit more different uh, from other uh, regulations. Uh, this is a federal law that uh, 
it was created to protect uh, investors uh, from public companies' frauds. For example, there were uh, big scandals when uh, some public companies uh, like changed their financial data which uh, allowed them to uh, gain some benefits, but uh, their investors lose money because of that. So this, uh, this act is actually to protect the reporting information uh, for public companies. Uh, it, doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with the data privacy because this data actually have to be public because uh, uh, public companies have to provide uh, periodic reports uh, so who must comply? Uh, basically, this affects uh, all public companies uh, in US uh, and also companies that plan to go public. So uh, if, if you're a startup and you want to go public, uh, you have to know that you should uh, be compliant with SOX uh, at least uh, in a year after you go public. So you have like an exemption period of one year uh, during which time you have to implement all the SOX uh, compliance procedure. Otherwise, uh, you'll be fined. Um, you have even, even SOX even like uh, implies that people can go to jail depending on the um, seriousness of the consequence. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically, uh, yeah, so Bain's SOX also uh, includes protection for whistleblowers. Uh, so basically a person that uh, can see that uh, there is a violation of SOX in their company can basically uh, notify uh, about such cases and these whistleblowers uh, are protected uh, by surveillance Oxley to facilitate the transparency. Uh, the most important section uh, for software development is the section 404, <laughs> funny enough. Uh, so management access of internal controls. Um, so uh, basically uh, this says that you have uh, to uh, actually uh, set up a set of uh, internal controls and uh, have a process of managing uh, these controls. So what are the internal controls? Internal controls are basically activities or processes uh, that are performed by either people or systems and are designed to ensure that uh, your business objectives uh, are met. Uh, there is also a concept of IT general controls that are the most common and basic controls that apply to information technology systems. So this includes applications, operating systems, databases, and infrastructure. And the objective of uh, IT general controls uh, is to ensure the integrity of your data and the process that uh, the system supports. Um, so these are the example of some common uh, IT general controls that, uh, that you should uh, implement uh, and manage if you want to be self-compliant. So the first one is backup management. You have uh, to have a process for backing up all your storages and databases that uh, contain financial data and reporting data. Uh, and you have to, for example, verify that your back backups are working uh, in any point of time. So like backup verification procedure uh, is, is a good practice to do that. Uh, the next one is change management, uh, which is obviously how you uh, uh, push new changes to your code. For example, if you don't have uh, um, a process like um, code review, this this uh, this violates the change management. For example, th th there should be uh, a person who at least one approval of your uh, change management. Uh, so at least someone should see that the new change is going uh, to uh, production, right? Um, and configuration management. This is like similar to the change management, management except that it relates to the infrastructure and your systems. The next one is identity and access management. So uh, you have to uh, be able to identify all persons and systems that work with uh, within your system and you have to have like a proper uh, access control. So not everyone should, should be able to access the data. You have to have some kind of roles uh, and groups and permissions, all of that kind of stuff. 
the next one is incident response, uh, which is sometimes it's overlooked, but it's really important concept. Uh, this is what you do if you have an incident. For example, if you're uh, if you are losing a, your database, if you're losing your data, uh, or you're disclosing the data, or the data was corrupted, uh, you have to have a process. Uh, uh, for, for such incidents, uh, which might include the incident manager uh, notification, uh, the procedure for, for mitigation, the recovery procedure, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so network operations relates to your networking. Risk management is mostly like uh, management uh, stuff, but uh, you have to understand that what, what is risk management and how to uh, do risk management properly. Uh, service life cycle is basically uh, how do you transfer your service uh, through different stages from, for example, from development to operation and transition uh, phases. Even if you're shutting down your service, this is the uh, life cycle event and you have to even shut down your services properly. Um, systems monitoring, uh, Again, this relates to uh, visibility of your system, uh, and yeah, every event basically has to be monitored. And vulnerability management is basically uh, what you do uh, if you discover an, a vulnerability in your system. How do you patch it? Uh, how, you, how do you detect it, uh, etc. And the data management uh, uh, basically relates to how do you work with your data, how you ensure your data is safe, uh, that it's uh, basically pro this correct, that it's consistent, uh, and stuff like that. So to actually, there is a COSO framework, which uh, is a framework developed by Committee of Sponsoring Organization of the Tradeway Commission. Uh, it's also like initiated to combat the corporate fraud, and they've developed a framework to assess your uh, IT general controls and verify that uh, uh, these controls are, uh, met the requirement. So I'm not gonna talk uh, uh, in more details about uh, COSO framework, but the key concepts are that internal control is a process. It's, it's not a thing, it's not like, um, it's basically a process which uh, is continuous. It doesn't have like a start, doesn't have an end. It is just a continuous thing. Uh, internal con uh, internal control uh, is carried out by people, not by like programs and systems. So basically, you have to understand that the control uh, people are responsible for internal controls, not not your code or programs. Uh, so uh, and the internal control can uh, pro provide on a, only reasonable security, not not like 100% security. So you have to understand that there will be uh, security issues and. Uh, Internal control is aimed at achieving objectives uh, in several categories, but overlapping categories. So, the compliance in the cloud. Just uh, this is going to be like a, a brief uh, coverage uh, of com compliance solution that you can use. For example, in Amazon, uh, you have to understand that it, they use like shared responsibility model uh, we shall like cover in the next slide but most of you probably know uh, what what is a shared responsibility model in AWS uh, there is like a concept of business associate addendum for example if you want to develop a HIPAA compliant application you have to sign this uh, business associate addendum this basically binds you and Amazon with the um, responsibilities related to processing uh, PHI and uh, Amazon is basically compliance ready, which means they uh, implement uh, compliance requirements from their side to their services, but the rest is up to you. You have to implement the, the, uh, the rest of the compliance regulations. Uh, and they also provide the services that will help you stay compliant. So uh, just uh, to talk uh, about um, Shared responsibility. This means, for example, if uh, your controls include uh, physical safeguards, like restricting physical access to your hardware, to your service, this is done by AWS because uh, they own the data centers, they secure the access to servers, database, and networking. 
uh, etc. But as a customer, uh, you are responsible for implementing secure uh, applications on top of that system. So, for example, uh, backup management uh, is, is your responsibility because uh, you can configure your database to have backups, you can configure it to not have backups. Uh, this is your responsibility. So, uh, you have to understand in, in which like a category uh, your controls uh, fall down under and basically uh, if it's your responsibility you have to implement that control if it's aws responsibility they will take care of that uh, okay uh, so uh, as an example of uh, services that will help you to be uh, compliant there is an aws macy which is a data security and privacy service um, this basically uh, this service helps you to uh, collect, uh, classify uh, your data in different storages, including S3 uh, and others. Uh, this basically looks for things like PHI or identifiable information. For example, if you have uh, emails, addresses, credit card numbers, anything else that is related to protected data, this uh, service will automatically discover this data. It will classify it uh, by the risk, risk level. So it, if it's like credit card number, for example, this can be the highest uh, uh, risk level of the data. If it's like address, uh, this might be less uh, critical data, but uh, anyway, this service will classify all your data. Uh, it will discover sensitive data and it will also take an action uh, uh, in case something goes wrong, for example, if there was not, not unauthorized access to your data, uh, this service will track it. Uh, it will help you to find such unauthorized requests. It will help to uh, trace uh, these uh, incidents uh, and uh, many more things. So you, you should really use this service if you uh, work with the PHI. This is really helpful. Uh, for example, there are third-party solutions uh, like uh, Clear Data Comply, which is a multi-cloud uh, compliance solution uh, that helps uh, developers to implement uh, HIPAA and GDPR compliance solutions. Uh, it works across different clouds, including AWS, uh, Google Cloud, and Azure. Uh, how it works is it basically uh, installs uh, its component into your cloud application. Uh, and uh, you basically allow their services to uh, proactively monitor your systems, uh, find uh, common vulnerabilities, uh, and ma making sure that uh, all your safeguards are in place, for example, database backups, uh, control access to your storage buckets, uh, encryption of your data, everything else is basically done automatically in, in case you have a uh, like issue with that, it will either notify you or it will just automatically fix that. Um, so this is really good. And also for city security, which is like an open source collection of uh, tools that will help you uh, to write secure and compliant applications in Google Cloud. Uh, so they have a, a bunch of tools that you can deploy yourself and uh, manage all your security and integrations. Uh, Okay, that's uh, basically uh, that's basically it. So, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, welcome. Are this third um, <clears throat> party? components which uh, check security by themselves also compliant with uh, yes, the security practices. Yeah. yeah, sure. So basically uh, how that works, uh, for example, if you want to use uh, a third party, so the, the for any security is open source. You, you basically use it yourself. Uh, there are no, no compliance issues here. Uh, for example, for managed services like clear data comply, uh, if you want to use the service, uh, you sign an agreement uh, because uh, you allow this uh, the services of that company to access your protected data. 
So you have to be legally uh, protected uh, to allow this company to use this data. And of course, the services of such solutions uh, in turn also compliant. Uh, so you are kind of safe in uh, that regard. So for example, in, in our project, uh, we work for a client that, that is uh, supplying such services. And we have a really strict rules uh, related to access to production and to databases uh, containing customer data and PHI. So uh, we kind of also uh, are business associates uh, of that client. So we have to also comply to all the uh, HIPAA requirements uh, that apply to, to the customer itself. Basically. Thank you.